We've all heard this take. In super woke Hollywood, Kraft has taken a backseat to progressive politics. The once celebrated dream factory is now a stage for showcasing fashionable social positions. There's a lucrative corner of YouTube belaboring this point, and oftentimes their observations are not unfounded. Nightshade's pronouns are they them. As to why this happened, maybe filmmakers have to toe the ideological party line. Maybe the ideas that get pushed through are the ones nobody dare criticize. Or maybe writers' rooms are dominated by elite university alumni who carry a perspective influenced by the Democratic Party's pivot away from working class issues towards identity politics to form their base. While there's probably some truth to all these, I want to zoom out and humor the notion that this shift is not what Hollywood imposed on us, but what we asked of Hollywood. See, movies don't only shape our ideologies, as we've discussed on the channel lately, they also give us tools to build our identities. I recently had a conversation with philosopher and fellow YouTuber Hans Georg Muller from the Carefree Wandering channel. In his book, You and Your Profile, Professor Muller explores how, historically, we have used different frameworks or technologies for identity construction. And I think his work can provide crucial insight into understanding why Hollywood embraced woke. If we look to cinema to inform our identities, then perhaps movies have evolved to mirror emerging modes of self-conception. One of their major, major functions is basically, again, to help build, help people build a sense of self, right? By reading books, by watching movies. Uh, we're not just, you know, we're not just entertained. We're not just whatever ideologically um, influenced in one way or another. Most importantly, from an existential perspective, we are kind of taught certain identity technologies. The first identity technology Muller identifies is called sincerity. In pre-modern times, identity was constructed through strict adherence to roles defined by one's ethnic background, social class, or religion. The first one, sincerity, means that you build a sense of self by sincerely committing to certain social roles, traditional social roles in older societies in particular, family roles and so forth. And so you sincerely commit to them. That means you internalize them both psychologically and behaviorally. And the simplest thing would be roles in the family. Though cinema is very much a product of modernity, it carries traces of sincerity in its depiction of movie stars from the Golden Age through the New Hollywood era. Hollywood crafted figures that represented social ideals, essentially role models that allowed audiences to situate themselves within the social fabric. John Wayne, for example, stood as a paragon of the American ethos, rugged individualism, the frontier spirit, self-determination, grit, etc. Jimmy Stewart brought to life the virtues of integrity and humility, while Audrey Hepburn embodied grace, compassion, and humanitarianism, particularly through her work with UNICEF. These stars functioned as social brands, offering audiences ideals to strive towards. He's looking at you, kid. It wasn't only stately idols, though. Cinema also portrayed figures who offered an ethos for those living decidedly unglamorous lives. Enter the king of the one-liners who gets no respect. Destroy my life, no respect. I don't get no respect at all, are you kidding? Rodney Dangerfield. A common thread in Rodney's movies is interrogating what it means to have class. You know what you got, Mr. M? You got class. Boy, I got no, uh... Class. Nah, we know I got class. Dangerfield, crass and overweight, doesn't seem like an obvious candidate for a symbol of class, but that's kind of the point. He embodied an understanding of class outside elite sentiments. While others schmooze with the rich at a fancy party, he hangs out with the help. Ramon. You look fantastic. No matter if he's rich or poor, he's always generous. Hey folks, it's on me. Shakespeare for everyone, okay? <laughs> Has no patience for pretense. Don't know gentlemen. I'm no doorknob either, all right? Shamelessly indulges in lowbrow pleasures and makes his way with street smarts, not book smarts. What about Macbeth? I saw the movie. Orson Welles. Yeah, you could drink, smoke, and gamble too much, but you got class if you treat people, especially your loved ones, well. Dangerfield offered a sincere ethos for people who had tough working conditions, who didn't have generational wealth or educational opportunities. People that, unfortunately in today's Hollywood, would likely be dismissed as deplorable, but that's a subject for another video. Hey everybody, we're all gonna get laid! <laughs>
The obvious problem with sincerity as an identity technology is the impossibility of completely aligning one's psychology with social expectations. The failure to live up to rigid roles can lead to significant distress, resulting in misery and even suicide. With the emergence of modernity, society became more dynamic. There were more choices regarding profession, religion, and marriage. So traditional roles began to feel like oppressive masks hiding a real identity. Thus, Muller's second technology, authenticity, gained prominence. Then there is basically a revolt against this that is happening uh, with a transition to modernity. And then role conform, role, sincere commitment to roles is regarded as as conformity and it becomes something bad instead you're now supposed to and this is the second uh, identity technology you're supposed to be or become authentic and authenticity can be defined as the pursuit of originality in the same vein, what you might call the pre-woke era of Hollywood was filled with movies about resisting social expectations so that a true self can flourish. Take Shrek, for instance. The premise is basically that Shrek and Fiona have to reject their socially imposed roles, in this case fairy tale slash Disney archetypes, and allow their true selves to emerge. Shrek initially internalizes the role of the stereotypical fairy tale beast, scary, mean, and meant to live in solitude. I'm an ogre! You know, grab your torch and pitchforks! But through his journey, he discovers that beyond the caricature lies someone who is heroic, loyal, and loving. Fiona starts off as the quintessential damsel in distress, but it doesn't fit her. One, because she can kick ass. And two, because she turns into an ogre at night. In the end, she permanently stays in ogre form, casting away traditional royalty roles and becoming a princess her own way. Donkey is shamelessly himself from the get, and Lord Farquaad is the opposite, obsessed with artifice, desperately trying to live up to the role of the strong and virile king. You know, the thing about onions. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers? You get it. We both have layers. Interestingly, Muller points out that the onion as a metaphor for identity was previously used by philosopher Henry Rosemont Jr. Each layer represents a different role we play. Husband, teacher, YouTuber, colleague, etc. Crucial to this is the fact that there is no core underneath the layers. When you peel them all back, there's nothing. Contra, for example, a peach in which there's a skin or our public-facing persona that masks a pit or the true self. For Rosemont, the point of the onion is that we are nothing but our social roles, that the idea of a real self is imaginary. Not exactly the same as Shrek's onion, which is much more in line with the metaphor of the peach, that there's a unique personality underneath our social masks. Anyway, bucking social roles in favor of authentic expression was all over cinema during this period. Billy Elliot pursues his passion for dance despite conventional gender roles. The kids of the Breakfast Club discover their genuine selves hidden beneath their cliquish labels. A kid's desire to pursue theater in Dead Poets Society clashes with his dad's expectations for a traditional career ending in his suit. In Whale Rider, a young girl challenges her tribe's repressive patriarchal traditions to become a leader. In Pleasantville, two teens travel to a 50s TV show to reveal stifling social conformity and encourage individual expression. I could go on. Point is, as we aspire to reject roles and express a genuine self, Hollywood sold us the dream of finding and expressing it. However, even authenticity has its problems. In his book, Muller recounts the story of a young guy determined to be authentic, only to realize that his defiance of social expectations was in itself shaped by those very constraints. Authenticity is paradoxical. You can never be truly authentic because distinguishing the self from roles is a blurry line that is constantly confounded by our interactions and experiences. Eventually, authenticity too fell out of favor, bringing us to our current era of profilicity, where identities are curated and broadcasted in an age of mass media and digital communication. I don't think that's really me. Okay, well remember there, Kyle, it's not so much about who you are as much as it is about what people are attracted to. There's been a transition going on uh, away from authenticity toward what we call profilicity. And that is an identity technology that operates by creating a profile and then presenting this profile and having it validated 
uh, basically in social validation feedback loops. Muller's work builds off sociologist Nicholas Luhmann's notion that in the 20th century, all social systems adopted what he calls second order observation, or the idea that we don't look at people or issues directly, but at how they are perceived by others. Consider this image of people celebrating New Year's 2024. Rather than enjoying the spectacle directly, people are more concerned with capturing an image curated for the gaze of others. It's less important that the event directly enrich their lives, and more important that it enrich their profile, that their experiences can translate to mass approval on social media. Think of it like Yelp reviews. When you look up a restaurant, you see how the restaurant is generally seen by others via the reviews. Today, we craft our identities for the same process. We want to be seen as having approval in the eyes of the general peer or a mass audience. We're constantly adjusting ourselves and our choices so we can be seen as being seen as desirable. Our identities are like stocks on the stock market. So if you observe the mar market value or the stock value, you just you don't look at whatever the the thing that the stock that the that that the that the financial instrument um, refers to or is based on. You have to look at how is this observed by the market. Moral approval is paramount to a good profile, so political activism becomes a prime opportunity to enhance our identity's market value. It's less about what we do and more about being recognized for advocating what is perceived as right. Thus, virtue signaling becomes essential for survival in social and often professional life. In Profilicity, we need to invest in the identity presented to the general peer, and cinema, as a disseminator of identity technologies, must sell us the fantasy of being synchronized with the gaze of this general peer. If sincere Hollywood sold us figures to live up to, and authentic Hollywood sold us the dream of finding our true selves, then prophilic Hollywood sells us the fantasy of inclusion in the group of those with desirable profiles. By watching movies that gesture towards social positions, we can feel part of the educated, socially conscious trendsetters. Watching Dear White People can simulate acknowledgement for awareness of privilege and marginalized voices. Watching The Eternals can simulate recognition for contributing to a more equitable entertainment industry. With Don't Look Up, you can situate yourself alongside the elites in media and academia outraged at lack of climate action. Or on the other side of the coin, if you watch Daily Wire movies like Ballers, you can simulate your inclusion in the ranks of culture warriors saving Western civilization. And if you watch Barbie, you can feel like a vanguard of feminism, ironically challenging power by parroting all the HR-approved buzzwords. Now, this isn't to say that these movies aren't good or that these social causes aren't worthy of our passions. That's not the point. The point is, if commentators suggest that Hollywood has given up on weaving dreams in favor of promoting political positions, I think they're missing the fact that, in the era of second-order observation, having the right political position is integral to our dreams, because in Professor Muller's words, morality is the hero of identity. Hollywood is in the business of selling dreams, dreams of self-understanding and self-cohesion, and wokeness and its mirror anti-wokeness in entertainment is perhaps an inevitable outgrowth of the demand for a sense of self under second-order observation. Now, it may seem like I'm suggesting that this kind of behavior is something that only less noble people participate in, but no. Profilicity is inescapable. Take Bernie Sanders, for instance. Dude's been saying the same thing for 40 years, so he really must believe it, right? Well, even if that's the case, his perceived authenticity works in favor of his profile. Bernie Sanders is branded as authentic not because he cynically paints himself this way for social gain, but because branding dominates our very semantics in the age of mass media. Second-order observation is just the way we think now. Yes, algorithms and social media play a big part in shaping the dynamics of profilicity, but importantly, social media did not create profilicity. Profilicity shaped social media, and by extension, cinema. The easiest way to, to explain this is, um, because this is where it basically was first applied, not, uh, not uh, to persons, not to humans, but to things that were marketed in the form of brands. So branding appeared uh, already in the 19th century, but then became like a big thing in the 20th century. And then later on, the idea is that, and especially now, of course, with developments in media and new media, 
uh, we've uh, kind of also internalized this and made it the way of building a sense of who we are and who, who others are. Uh, later on, basically, I think the new technologies and specifically the new media developed in the way they developed because they could be used, uh, they, they, they lend themselves so perfectly for profiling. But the important thing to remember about identity is it's all bull We need identity to simplify the impossible messiness of being human. And no identity technology can account for all the contradictions inside us. Truth is, we have no option but to pretend. Muller uses the term genuine pretending. Basically, we should understand that identity is a performance, a never-ending process of discovery via exploration. Like a child playing make-believe, we have no choice but to experiment with different identities by pretending. And of course, social media, art, and movies are going to inform that process. But by developing an awareness of it, maybe we can ease the intensity of identity and not be too sacred about living up to it. Identity is just another story we tell ourselves to maintain sanity, and, well, Hollywood is in the business of peddling stories that ease our minds. And in the spirit of easing identity, maybe we should also ease the narrative that a bunch of ideologically compromised hacks are tainting our entertainment. That, too, is probably just a story we tell ourselves to simplify our impossibly complex social environment. Hey, thanks for watching and thanks to Professor Moeller for collaborating on this video. Be sure to check out his channel, Carefree Wandering, and his book, You and Your Profile. Don't forget to follow me on Letterboxd, where you can track all the movies I've been watching. Hit me up on Twitch, join the Discord, and if you want to support the channel financially, you can head over to my coffee page, where you will also find a link to my full conversation with Professor Moeller. There's no paywall, but... If you feel inspired to contribute, donations are always welcome and help the channel continue. Links are in the description. Appreciate you all, and catch you later. Peace.